Hey guys, and welcome back. So today I just want to get straight into it. So on Sunday, April 24, 2016, which was the Anzac Day long weekend, members of the public were down at a place called Snapper Point, which is a popular but rather dangerous fishing spot about a one and a half hour drive north of Sydney. And the area is considered dangerous because it's full of steep and jagged volcanic rock that have led to people falling from the cliff face or being swept into the ocean by the unpredictable waves in the area. And in the last decade alone, 16 people have actually died at this site. Often tourists, which have led locals to name this stretch of water Death Stretch or Death Rock. But back to the weekend in question, at around 10.30am, a member of the public was fishing, you know, doing whatever they do, when they looked down into the blowhole and they noticed something floating in the water. Upon closer inspection, they realised that this object was a body. And thinking that this was simply just another victim of this named death stretch, death rock, They phoned the police to let them know what they had discovered. And it wasn't long before a helicopter turned up with paramedics to retrieve the body. But upon closer inspection of this body, police and paramedics very quickly realised that this was not simply another person that had fallen from the cliff face. This was somebody that had met a very gruesome end. The victim was a female and she was found naked with her clothing nowhere to be found in the area. She also had 30 or over 30 actually stab wounds to her neck as well as defensive wounds. And as well as not being able to find her clothing anywhere in the area, the investigation couldn't find anything that belonged to this mystery woman and therefore they had no way to identify her. They soon released a computer generated image to the public in an effort to identify the mystery woman that the media soon dubbed the Snapper Point Jane Doe. The victim was described as of Asian appearance, aged between 20 and 35 years old at around 170 centimetres tall, with a medium build and shoulder length dark brown hair. She also had not been in the water very long, meaning that she was likely somebody that had recently been reported missing, or somebody that had not had any contact with friends or family over the Anzac Day long weekend. And it wasn't long before online users actually noticed similarities between a missing Sydney woman and this snapper point Jane Doe. By the following Friday, police had confirmed that the mystery woman was 25-year-old international Chinese student Mengmei Lang, known in Australia as Michelle, which is what I'm going to be calling her for the remainder of today's video. However, police were rather baffled as to how Michelle got to Snapper Point because she actually lived in the suburb of Campsie in Sydney, which was about a 100 kilometer drive or about 62 miles from Snapper Point. And this wasn't an area that Michelle was known to frequent or have any connections to. However, in a very eerie coincidence, just Three years earlier, Michelle had visited this spot and had taken a photo of the exact same blowhole in which her body would eventually be found and posted it to her Instagram. Earlier media reports in this case did suggest that Michelle had planned to meet up with a date, a person that she had met online on the night that she disappeared But this was quickly debunked by the investigation. So before we get any further into this case or the investigation, I want to tell you a little bit about who Michelle was. So as mentioned, Michelle was born and raised in China and she had a very close bond with her mother, Mei Zhang, which only strengthened after the untimely death of her father in an earthquake some years earlier. In 2011, Michelle moved to Sydney, Australia to further her education and better her life. 
She studied business and economics at the University of Technology, Sydney, eventually graduating with a double degree. So Michelle was really one smart cookie. When she began working, Michelle started sending money back home to support her family. In Sydney, Michelle lived in an apartment block in Campsie, as I mentioned, with her auntie, uncle, and cousin. Her uncle, Derek Barrett, or Barrett? who was her uncle through marriage, had only been married to her auntie for a couple of years, from what I can tell, and was actually only two years older than Michelle. Derek was 27, and Michelle's auntie was 48. Upon Michelle moving in with family, Michelle's mother, May, felt rather relieved that her daughter would be moving in with such close, reliable family, and she really believed that her daughter would be safe living with them in a big city like Sydney. So to get a bit more of a look into who Michelle was as a person, I had a bit of a scroll through her Instagram, which is still live and viewable. It's now one of the memorial accounts or the remembering accounts. And I know that Instagram isn't necessarily an accurate representation of who somebody is, but on a surface level, I would hazard a guess in saying that Michelle was a massive foodie. She loved to both cook and bake as well as go out for a nice meal, especially with friends. She was also a lover of the beach, nature, animals, and she definitely was not opposed to the odd selfie or two. Her bio read, keep it simple and follow your heart. And looking at her photographs, I really do get the impression that Michelle was somebody that enjoyed the simple pleasures in her life. So let's skip ahead to the afternoon of Thursday, April 21, when Michelle told friends that she was heading into the city for an afternoon of shopping. And that's exactly what she did. At 3pm, we can see Michelle on CCTV shopping at the Pitt Street Mall in Maya, which is a retailer that I would say is comparable to Macy's. If Macy's still exists, I have no idea. But anyway, she then buys a juice and heads to the St. James train station. Shopping bags in hand, she jumps on the train home, arriving back in Campsy at roughly 4.30pm. From there, Michelle would have presumably walked home to her apartment block, but police weren't really sure if that's where she went or if she even made it home. However, friends did hear from her later that evening online, but lost all contact or contact ended late on Thursday evening. And after that, Michelle was never seen or heard from again until her body was found on Sunday morning. The following day, her cousin, who lives at the apartment, stops by for about three hours, but sees no sign of Michelle, although Michelle is not presumed to be missing at this point. And her uncle, Michelle's uncle Derek, was also home during this time. By the Monday, when nobody has seen or heard from Michelle over the long weekend, she is reported missing to the police, although different articles said that different people reported her missing. Some said friends did, some said her auntie did. Regardless, she was reported missing on the Monday. And her friends and family did as much as they could to spread the message or spread uh, word of her disappearance online, especially on a Chinese social media website called Weibo. Also, by the way, this, this disappearance was very out of character, so her friends and family would have been incredibly worried, which is why, as you would, of course, they were really trying to push the story out there to, so as many people as possible could hear about Michelle's disappearance. And it was actually the user's of this website, the social media site Weibo, that made the connection between the snapper point Jane Doe and Michelle Lang. But this leads us to asking what happened to Michelle between Thursday afternoon when she went shopping and Sunday morning when her body was found? Where did she go? What happened? Who did she meet? This was a very smart woman, somebody that didn't just go off with a stranger or put herself in situations where she could be in danger. And as far as people knew, she had no known enemies. Although one theory going around at the time again came from the social media site Weibo that perhaps it had been an Asian hate crime and they actually warned fellow international students to be extra careful who they met up with and where they went just 
in case. Police, however, had other ideas and they were beginning to believe that the killer was much closer to home than they first thought. But we'll get back to that in just one second. Also during this time, Michelle's mother, May, flies into Australia to speak at a press conference. And through a translator, she states, Even today, I cannot accept the fact that she has left us and we are still in great suffering. It will never turn back to a time when Meng Mei and I were living happily together. End quote. And to add even further tragedy to it, everything this family was currently going through, Michelle's grandmother, who was apparently in perfectly good health, upon hearing of her granddaughter's awful passing, she passed away when she heard this news. So as is standard protocol, the police began looking into those that were closest to Michelle. Her auntie had a rock solid alibi. She was actually in the city of Wollong- Wollong- Wollongong. That is a hard one to say. I, I know of Wollong- well, Wollongong. I know of the place. It's about, it's like a little city south of Sydney. I just, I just can't pronounce anything. But anyway, she was there for work, which was a common occurrence. So again, she had an alibi. Her cousin, who lived with Michelle and her auntie and uncle also had an alibi, which left police to look a little bit closer into her uncle, Derek. Oh, and I should also mention that her auntie would actually later state how incredibly guilty she felt over Michelle's murder. She believed that maybe if she had been there, she could have prevented this from happening or done something to protect her, but chances are she couldn't have. So Derek, who was a former IT worker, certainly had a few alibis for the police. At first, he claimed that he had been home all weekend, three hours of which could technically be confirmed by Michelle's cousin. But he then told police that he was having an affair with a prostitute and had been with her the entire time. But then we changed his story once again. He told the police that he had an ice addiction, and as a result, he suffered from memory loss because he had been using ice or meth the entire weekend. Unsurprisingly, the police thought that his stories were rather absurd and began looking a little closer into Derek, particularly looking closer at his phone and his phone's locations on the weekend of the murder. And upon checking these records, police saw that on the morning Michelle's body was found, just 25 minutes before it was found, in fact, Derek's phone pinged at a place called Doyleson, which was located just 10 minutes or six odd miles from Snapper Point, where Michelle was found. Police did come to learn that Derek was from this area, from a place or a town called Guandalan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess. Meaning that he was very aware of the existence of this below hole at Snapper Point. Of course, because Derek was from this area, he was born and raised in this area, and he was actually visiting friends and family on the weekend Michelle's body was found, or the morning of, he could very easily say to police that it was just one big massive coincidence that he happened to be visiting home on the same weekend that Michelle's body was found. But then again, how did Michelle's body very coincidentally get to where Derek was born and raised? That is just a little bit too much of a big coincidence. And of course, the police thought this as well. So of course, police began digging just a little bit deeper into Derek's life and again, his phone when they came across a series of deleted videos and images of Michelle that confirmed their worst fears. And I'm going to put a warning in here now. I do talk about sexual assault. Of course, I'm not going to go into explicit detail. I never do but it is something that is mentioned. So if this is something that triggers you, it's probably best to switch off now. In several of these images found on Derek's phone, Michelle is lying on her bed, bound and gagged with black duct tape with a look of fear and terror on her face, according to the police. And in the videos, which were filmed before the weekend of her murder, Michelle is clearly 
unaware that she is being filmed in some of the footage which was filmed on some kind of hidden camera in the bathroom it shows michelle going into the bathroom getting undressed and having a shower and in another video it shows derek preparing a bath for michelle which michelle then proceeds to take and in another video and this is very disturbing it shows derek masturbating over michelle's body as she slept and unfortunately this wasn't derek's only victim in another video it again shows derek masturbating over a young girl as she sleeps although although this young girl has not been publicly identified of course understandably so i don't know any more information on that or if he was even charged with that anyway of course all of this evidence isn't exactly looking very good for derek and on april 30 derek barrett is arrested and charged with the murder of michelle Lang, although he denies any involvement in the murder. And I do just have to read you this statement from his lawyer about regarding his bail application and place of incarceration because it's beyond laughable. It really is. His lawyer states, it's a terrible place to be incarcerated and I can only hope he'll be moved in the very near future and I'll be making a bail application in the not so distant future. Obviously, he's very upset and shocked, end quote. And I really don't know what to even say to that. It's just, he's shocked and upset? Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, okay. So let's briefly go over what police believed happened between the Thursday and the Sunday on the weekend of the murder. Sometime late on Thursday evening, April 21, Derek unexpectedly enters Michelle's upstairs bedroom, forcing her to strip naked. He then bound and gagged her and shoved a white cloth in her mouth to prevent her from screaming. He then continued to take a series of incredibly inappropriate photos of Michelle. The following day, Michelle's cousin comes by, as I stated before, for about three hours. And she said that Derek was in the bathroom with the shower running for the entirety of her visit for three hours, which is weird. She said that she did at one point knock on the door to get some shampoo out of the bathroom and he handed it to her through the door. Again, she saw no sign of Michelle. And of course, all the while she was there visiting, she had no idea that her own cousin was being kept captive upstairs. It's believed that Michelle was likely murdered later on the Friday after her cousin left, at some time transported to the boot of Derek's car, and then driven up to Snapper Point early on the Sunday morning. The final piece of evidence tying Derek to Michelle's murder was CCTV footage of his car driving into the Lake Munmora National Park at about 7 a.m. on the morning her body was found. And of course, this national park is where Snapper Point is located. At the trial, Derek Barrett pleads guilty to murder, as well as multiple other charges, including detaining for advantage, committing acts of indecency, and filming private parts without consent. At the trial, in which he was found fit to stand, by the way, he really amps up the tears and the emotion throughout, and he does stick to his story of memory loss due to his ice addiction. In court, he claims that over the Anzac Day long weekend, he had been using ice the entire time and could barely remember any of his actions, although he claimed that he was incredibly remorseful for anything that he may have done while under the influence. And in response to his excuse, Justice Helen Wilson stated, In my 30 years as a criminal lawyer, I have not seen an obese methamphetamine addict, end quote, which honestly is kind of a bit of a burn. So uh, well done, Justice Wilson. <laughs> and when Barrett took the stand, he claimed 
that this moment in my life has kept me awake at night in tears and I still have nightmares. All I can do in some small way is to commit my life to trying to make up for what I have done in any possible way. End quote. He even wrote a letter of apology to Michelle's mum, May, to really push home his point of feeling super remorseful. Thankfully, Justice Wilson saw straight through his little act, labelling his crimes as extremely violent and brutal that stemmed from perverted sexual obsession with the victim. He was eventually found guilty and sentenced to 46 years in prison, which is pretty good by Australian justice standards, with a non-parole period of 34 years, although this is not quite the end of the story as far as his sentence and crimes go, but we're going to get back to that in just one second. He did, of course, appeal as they always do, but was denied. So several years later, some mystery evidence would very bizarrely show up in a very strange place that would show the full extent of Derek Barrett's crimes, his sexual crimes, and exactly just how much Michelle Lang had suffered during her final hours alive. In 2019, a daughter was visiting her mother, who was elderly and suffered from dementia, in her home in Strathfield, which is another suburb in Sydney, when she noticed her mother was clutching a small object in her hand. Upon further inspection, she noticed that the object was a USB stick. She asked her mother what this was or where it came from, and her mother actually had no idea what she had and had thought it was a toy. So, of course, out of curiosity, as I think we all would, she plugged the USB stick into a computer to see what was on it and try to figure out where it had come from. And what she saw on this USB stick sickened her to her stomach and she immediately contacted the police. Contained on this USB stick were nine videos running for a total of an hour in length and 13 photographs showing the full extent of the sexual assault that Michelle had suffered through before her murder. And of course, this evidence, evidence of sexual assault, was evidence that the investigation had not previously had, although of course they highly suspected it. Unfortunately, they couldn't actually prove it because of the state of Michelle's body having been in the water and even the video and photograph evidence they initially had didn't actually prove that she had been assaulted, sexually assaulted. Again, of course, I will not go into graphic detail about what was on this USB stick, but it does show Derek entering Michelle's bedroom and the look of confusion on her face as he enters. It also shows him bounding and gagging her, and shows him rearranging and positioning Michelle on her bed, pretty much just throwing her around like a rag doll. And of course, the videos do show the sexual assault. And what they also do show is the look of absolute fear and terror on Michelle's face, and also Michelle begging her uncle to stop what he's doing. And we can also see, or not we, but the police also saw that Derek had a sickening look of enjoyment on his face. For someone that was claiming to be high on ice, he didn't appear to be acting that way. He just appeared to be one sick fucking individual that was taking sheer enjoyment out of torturing a member of his family, a young girl that was saying, stop, 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 and he wasn't listening. So how this USB stick came into the possession of this elderly woman is still a mystery to this day because she has no connection to Michelle or Derek. She doesn't particularly live close to Campsie. So she lived about six kilometers or 3.7 miles from Campsie. So it's, yeah, it's, real, it's a really, it's a strange one. That's for sure. But anyway, this new evidence did eventually add nine new sexual offenses to Derek Barrett's crimes and 20 years to his sentence. However, this was to be served concurrently, meaning that his 46-year original sentence 
would not change, but his non-parole period did change slightly from 34 years to 36.5. And Justice Wilson did state in regards to this change that had she known the full extent of his crimes at the original trial, she would have sentenced him to life in prison without parole, I assume. And this was actually the sentence that Michelle's family had been pushing for, understandably. But Justice Wilson stated that due to legal principle, that sentence cannot now be imposed. Although I don't really understand why, but then again, I'm not a lawyer. If you understand what this sort of legalities around that decision may be, let me know down below. And Derek Barrett will be eligible for parole in the year 2052. I think one of the most tragic things about this case is the fact that Michelle left her mum, who she was so incredibly close to in China, and moved to Australia for a better life. Yet what she got was this sick and twisted man, someone that she considered family, someone that she should have been able to trust, that became obsessed with her to the point that he sexually assaulted and brutally murdered her and then threw her away like a piece of trash. My heart truly does break for the friends and family of Michelle Lang, who seemed like an incredibly sweet and incredibly smart young girl. But let me know your thoughts down below on today's case. And until next time, stay vigilant and stay safe.